And welcome everyone to Small Biz Matters, the half hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. My name is Alexi Boyd, of course, your small business advocate, lover of all things admin and bookkeeping. And of course, um, a welcomer of fantastic guests. We've got a wonderful guest again today in the studio. Melinda Livingston is here to talk to us all about the gig economy and how we can best tap into that. But first, I wanted to let you all know that I was happy to be invited along to the Cisco Australia New Zealand launch of a brand new product that they've got. It's it's basically, well, my take on it was pretty much a platform where Cisco is offering a better package for small businesses in the realm of internet connectivity, as well as uh, hardware products, software products, and a platform on which you can control your IT management. Now, why I was excited about this, I mean, this just sounds like another, you know, big business sp- you know, getting themselves into the into the small business economy, of course, because we all know as small businesses that we are a very powerful group of um, of, of businesses brought together. But singly, we, we probably don't have that much power. It was nice to see as well that we had Peter Strong from the uh, Small Business Association as well, which was great to have him there representing. But what I liked about Cisco's product was that they're not actually selling it directly to us. They're using other small businesses and medium-sized businesses to access uh, us and and sell it uh, almost a second, a resellers, if you wish. And what I liked about it was that they had uh, a lot of IT professionals that they're bringing on board as what they call partners. um, And it's part of their wider strategy to address the challenges faced by small and medium-sized business when when it comes to digitization. Another real focus was the cybersecurity element as well. They're recognizing that small business is really struggling under the weight of all the the ways that they can be infiltrated, whether it be through emails or through um, literally somebody just hacking into your network and, and remaining in the background there and being unsafe. And one of the things that they're launching is a, a thing called the umbrella where I guess it's the way I thought of it was it's a bit of a patch. It's a, a something that you subscribe to, I think. They haven't quite got all the details out yet, but it pretty much blocks IP addresses that they have recognised through their, their research to be unsafe. So say, for example, you're being um, tapped into by a particular IP address that is known to have insidious activity and it's known to be a phishing scam or anything like that. They will block it for you before it even reaches anywhere near any of your data, which I thought was quite helpful. It is a bit of a minefield out there and it's great to see the big boys, A, recognising small business as the real uh, market op- opportunity for them that, that we are and that we have power in that, but also that they're, they're partnering with other small businesses to, to deliver this product. I was lucky enough to um, to interview uh, Ken Boll, who is the um, CEO of of Cisco uh, Australia New Zealand and he was able to give me a little bit of insight into the product and we're going to hear a little bit from him now. And welcome back to Small Biz Matters, the half hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. I am here with Ken Bowl, who is the head of Cisco Systems and has just uh, in- made an incredible launch which we're very excited about here on Small Biz and it sounds to me like a partnership between Big business and little business bridging the gap when it comes to uh, internet connectivity and all those needs and infrastructure and everything like that. Now, I want to ask you some big picture stuff, Ken. Um, I mentioned in the in the chat that I had great concerns about internet connectivity and this being a huge hurdle for small business. Um, are all of these grand plans possible if we don't get that right, in your opinion? Well, internet connectivity is an absolute necessity, Alexi. It's um, it's critical for Australia. Um, listen, I think we're made we're making pretty good headway. There is there's improving internet access for residential and business um, business users more and more. Clearly, the NBN is a is a major work in progress, but it's, I think it's making good progress now and. I don't think there's too many uh, firms that can possibly argue that they, they're not getting the right scale of internet capability today. Now, it can always be better. We always want it cheaper, faster, better, um, and that will come in time. But it's an absolute um, critical part of a, of, a, of a business nowadays. Let's face it, if the internet goes off the air, the business goes off the air. There's, In many cases, there's no longer a backup. There's no longer cash in the till. So these um, internet services are absolutely critical. And um, I think more and more businesses are realising that. 
We only have to look at the fact that when a bank goes down for 24 hours and the impact that that has on small business, for example, you're absolutely right. Now, one of the other things that I was quite excited about in the uh, presentation was you bridging the gap between what you are, which is a large organisation, down to small. And you're doing that through partnering with management consultants. And it's great that you are recognising their level of expertise. Has that been a fundamental part of this and will it continue in the rollout as, as this program gets bigger? Absolutely, Alexia. I think we, um, we're, a, we're a big collaborator. We realise if we're going to help Australian small business thrive in the era of digital, we can't do it alone. Uh, we don't have the breadth and the footprint to go and work with the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of small businesses. So to do that, we build a network that is a, uh, a partnership network with all sorts of firms. You touched on management consultants. That's absolutely. For people that advise small business are critical because that's what small business need is up-to-date, relevant, accurate advice around how to build these appropriate digital platforms for small business. And what's the right stepping stones to do that? So the management consultants play a role, our service providers, our telecommunications carriers play a role, um, computer resellers, regional players play a role. There's a whole, whole set of, of organisations that we're working with to get it done. And we've had to do our own work. We've had to make our own changes as well, Alexi, in that we've had to bring the technology, build the right technology for small business. Um, it's no good just taking large industrial scale networking equipment and trying to literally flog that off to small business owners. Um, we've had to absolutely simplify the technology. I wouldn't say dumb it down. I'd actually say uh, absolutely to simplify it, to create, take that power of the enterprise technology, but to simplify it so that small business can put it to good use to get the value out of it to support their business growth. I think what you're trying to say there is you're trying to remove the corporate speak that we don't really understand and trying to get it down to what you're actually trying to target and solve the problem. And that's what Peter alluded to in the in the meeting as well. It's it's what is the solution to my problem? So I can't, I have concerns about, uh, you know, cyber security attacks and ways of them getting in there. What is the solution to that? Can you tell me a little bit more about the umbrella product? Because I think that's definitive and I noticed that when you were mentioning it you were uh, 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 trying to shy away from a, um, a restrictive approach but it's not that is it it's more of a protective approach would you agree that, that's exactly right and these things are always opt-in I think you know cyber security it's it's a massive issue for everybody big firms and small firms alike and I think we're We've still got a long way to go. As I mentioned, there's a lot of cyber fatigue. And in small firms who don't have an IT expert at hand at all times, how do you cope with the constant deluge of updates and patches and things that need to be done in order to stay secure? So what we're trying to do is to bring products that automate some of that, that prevent the issues uh, from occurring before they actually occur. And that is the umbrella product. And the, the analogy here is like providing clean drinking water. When you turn on the tap, you want to know that that, that source of water is devoid of nasties and malicious bugs and what have you, and malware, and that you trust that source of, of water. Same thing with internet services. And so what umbrella does is it it protects organisations and individual users from nasties that are out there on the internet. And uh, that's really important because what many sites that look good, they look fine, um, we're agnostic of the content, but they may, some of these sites might be full of malware. And this malware might not affect your, you or your firm straight away. Often these malwares are sitting in your organisation for hundreds of days and literally potentially filtering information out of your organisation, certainly while you don't know about it. So Umbrella stops all of that. And as I said, it's content agnostic, but it really provides that. Um, we provide a global insight as to essentially what are the good sites 
and one of the bad sites, not on content, but on the maliciousness of the malware on some of these uh, websites around the world. Speaking about cybersecurity and where Australia sits in its uh, data breach um, situation at the moment, um, I've heard a statistic recently that the uh, the place where you need to say where your data breach has happened is about two years behind in processing the data breaches. Are we really that far behind the rest of the world? We look at what's just happened in the EU. They've got 48 hours to notify of a data breach and yet here you've got up to, what is it, 30 days to, to notify. Uh, are we behind the rest of the world in your opinion? Well, it's fairly new in Australia. I mean, the data breach notification scheme was only kicked off in February. That's what I'm saying. Are we behind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, listen, I think... I don't know that we're behind. I think, I mean, obviously with Europe, they've just, they're have just they introducing even more, let's say, stringent requirements about around information privacy. So Australia, this is a really good move. This is just what we need as a nation. Because we've got to be able to trust the digital systems that are powering the economy. If we lose trust, then heaven help us. Um, that could that could be uh, you know, severely impacting our overall economy. So we've got to get we've got to get trust in. We've got to maintain trust into the system. So that requires that every firm at every level lift its capabilities around cyber. Notifying around data breaches is an important thing to do. It shouldn't be the call of, of shame. Rather, it's about understanding, alerting, and remediating from there. Because as a nation, we will learn about what's actually happening on the internet so that we can remediate, fix, and get on with building the, the better digital platforms, the more secure digital platforms in the future. Now, the government agencies that, that is responsible, they are flat out. They are getting... Uh, the good news is, is that these breaches are being notified, as they should be. Um, and I think, you know, we're still in the early days, and, I, and no doubt they're in the early days of working through the processes and guiding small, medium and large firms around, around the notifications, what to do. Uh, there's some good apparatus in the Australian system here. We've got the Joint Cyber Security Centres and the Australian Cyber Security Centres as well. The government's put some good firepower and muscle behind um, cyber security. It's come a long way in two years, but I think over the next two years, we're going to have to go and equally, you know, uh, <laughs> just as far in the future. Look, thank you very much for joining us here on Small Biz Matters. Really appreciate you sharing some of your insights on the bigger picture of where we sit in terms of connectivity and cyber security across Australia and, and the impact that it's going to have on small, biz small business as well. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Good one. Thanks, Alexi. Back to Small Biz Matters. We're here in the studio today and I'd like to thank uh, Cisco for inviting me along to that launch last week. It was very interesting, interesting to hear the big boys, uh, hear how they're trying to tap into the market that is small business and uh, how they've got a, a better idea of the bigger picture of the issues that we have. <laughs> what I did find a little bit of interesting was at the beginning of the program, Ken did mention the fact that he felt that in internet connectivity was improving. Um, I would suggest otherwise. And uh, today, my, my guest, Melinda Livingstone, might have some opinion on that as well, because you are you are tapped into small business like um, like very few people that I know. So welcome to the program, Melinda, firstly. Thank you so much for having me today, Alexi. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, it's it's going to be a great show because I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you all about the gig economy. It's something that we as small businesses might shy away from or get nervous about or in fact some of us might get a little bit boisterous and cross with because we think that it is um, I guess leveling the playing field in a way that makes things a little bit unfair but we're going to talk a little bit about that today and also more importantly how we as small businesses can connect into the gig economy and make it something really quite beneficial for our business which I'm, I'm super excited about so firstly I, I love to hear uh, people like yourself what is your journey tell me a little bit about how you came to to start um, in, income connections oh thank you Alexi well I um, spent the first 20 years of my career um, in superannuation investment and financial planning and one of the problems that I saw was that many people retire with not enough money to live comfortably so the age pension is insufficient and it's being reduced all the time. So, for example, my parents-in-law last year had their pension cut for because of threshold changes, so nothing that they, they did. And that's obviously a very difficult position to, to recover from. And 
So when I left my um, corporate job, I thought, what can I do to solve this problem for ordinary Australians? So wages growth is flat and it's really hard for working people to save enough money for retirement. And I looked at the future of work as part of my thesis for my master's. Mm. And I... um, I saw that the sharing economy is is growing and creating really great opportunities for people to to generate an income. And so I brought those things together and and started my business, um, Income Connection. And as a business owner, I have my own business and I'm married to somebody who works in a small business. And I can see... Aren't we nuts? (laughs) I know. Isn't it nuts? (laughs) I I live and breathe small business and I can see that there's these really great opportunities for small businesses to get involved in the sharing economy as well. Do you think it's somewhere that we've we've missed that boat in a way? I mean, because of that whole, I don't want to get involved, I have to compete with people who are, um, you know, charging half the rate of what I do for exactly the same thing, but I know I'm doing a better job than they are. Do you think there's a fear of people in small business of, of the gig economy for that reason? I think there's a little bit of that, but I think also increasingly small businesses are seeing it as an opportunity. And I think that's why it's so great to be here today because we can talk about all of those opportunities. Yeah, exactly. Now, I checked out your website, obviously, before you came on coming on the program. Um, What I love is it's not just about the people. You're also tapping into, um, I guess, facilities and things that small businesses can use and utilise rather than just ex people at X dollars per hour. Can you tell me a little bit more about those things that small business oh, can look, access? Absolutely. So um, one, of the, one of the big opportunities is sharing spare capacity. So businesses from time to time will have spare capacity. So either seasonality or they'll lose a key client and they'll find that they've got some spare capacity. So spare capacity in terms of office space, warehousing space, um, factory space. Might Even be- desks spare desk, yeah. you know, spare um, meeting room or even spare staff, you know, and staff are a really big cost for business. Um, spare logistics and, and if you've, if as a business you might have your own spare, like you might have your own um, protri- proprietary logistics and um, shipping. Mm. Like, you know, if you think of all of the assets that you have in your, your business, you've got a You've got assets that at some time have have some spare capacity and that capacity can be shared with other businesses and you can earn money on that spare capacity. And there are platforms in the sharing economy that enable you to monetize that and they will they create a marketplace for you to find a counterpart to, to buy that capacity off you and they will collect the, the money... F- the payment, the rent, um, and often provide insurance and, and other benefits as well. It's kind of like, I mean, we're all pretty familiar with someone like Airtasker, but it's almost an Airtasker for things. Absolutely. Yeah, like the internet of things. There's all, there's all of these, you know, niche, niche marketplaces out there. Like even, um, yeah, you know, if you've got a trucking business, mm. you know, there's a... There's a um, there's freight exchange. You know, mm. you could um, find a, a marketplace for, for spare capacity in your trucking business. That's right. And and as you mentioned before, you know, one of the biggest costs and often the most unused costs is when you take on a staff member and you think, oh, look, I can use them for this amount of time, but uh, I'd like to bring them on full time just in case for seasonality reasons. Mm. I need them at a certain point, but then I don't need them at other times. Is it difficult to outsource People, people is, is a little bit harder because you you obviously want you've got duty of care over the employee. Yeah. You want to give them a really good experience. Yeah, there is a platform called Talent Loop that specialises in exactly that: the secondment of staff where they've got spare capacity. Yes, um, but I think for if you've got that mindset of sharing your staff spare capacity, yeah. Um, by all means, use uh, a platform like Talent Loop. But I think um, probably the best way to, to, to use that spare capacity is, is to think about um, who in your, your network would be a good um, kind of partner to use that spare capacity. So it could be um, your suppliers, um, your customers, and maybe even um, your industry peers mm-hmm. and just be thinking ahead and see it as an opportunity t- for development for that staff member. 
um, because if they then come back to you after that experience of maybe spending time with your customer, they'll come back with um, richer experience that they will bring back to your business and, and hopefully the staff member will see it as a, as a career development. Yeah, that's right. And I remember we had um, Ush Danak on the program a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago now talking about the importance of not hoarding your staff. Do you think it's a bit risky that they may see that the grass is a bit greener on the other side or in your experience to talking to people is it more about them coming back and going oh thanks for that opportunity I really saw that as an opportunity for me to improve my professional Uh, development. Look I think if if you see developing your staff as a way of investing into them Mm. um, they're going to be grateful Mm. to you. I mean I've certainly spent time in my career where I have been underutilised and I've been really frustrated. That's um, true, isn't it? You, know, you don't all... feel valued, you don't feel yeah. appreciated. And yeah. if you are fully utilised as an employee, um, you're, going to be, you're going to feel really valued and appreciated. And I think if you're th- thought to be, uh, if, if, if your, your employer is so pleased and proud of the work that you do that they're happy to at risk of using an incorrect word, share you with, um, you know, their, their, their professional uh, people with which they have professional relationships, then that would instill a little bit of pride in it, wouldn't it? Just oh, thinking, oh, well, they're happy enough to, for, to yeah. me to represent their business elsewhere. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. You'd want to just set up the HR, um, you know, get that all, all the paperwork for that so it's all done properly. Yes. Um, and, and I guess having some legal eyes over that sort of contract is a very yeah. good idea as well. And look, you well. could get uh, an expert to do that from uh, a platform called Expert360. Uh, let's talk a little <laughs> bit more about... We're going to come back after the break and talk a bit more about all those fabulous platforms that are available um, and where they can find out more about it, obviously, through your website. You are listening to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. I'll be back after this. So, back in the room, we are talking to Melinda Livingston, who is here from Income Connections and a great concept, which is basically bringing together the gig economy and how small business can tap into that. It's something that we might occasionally shy away from, but it's an important thing, uh, an important resource that we need to be able to access as small businesses, not only because there's lots of capacity for us to share ourselves, but obviously um, the ability to utilise what other people might be able to provide for us. Now, just... Just before the break, we were talking about um, the way we can share personnel, perhaps. Uh, definitely an option when you've got excess capacity. Just make sure you get a legal eye to have a look over the contracts. And you mentioned a couple of websites where people can um, tap into to make sure that they're doing that all properly. What were those? some of those websites for people? Yeah, so um, Talent Loop is, is a... Um secondment website, Mm -hmm. um, a marketplace. And then if you're wanting to get a HR person to look over the arrangement for that, Expert360 is a good uh, website for getting a a HR person to come in and have a look over that. And is that somewhere where if you yourself are an expert, you might want to consider getting yourself listed? Why why is that one of your favourites? Oh, look, I love Expert360. It's an Australian-based platform Mm. uh, and it's got an absolute depth of, of talent um, so if you're looking for any type of um, professional uh, consultant to come into your business and, and give you some advice, um, you can get them in to come in for a contract of any length of time. And um, because they're um, kind of on demand, they come in and then they help you and then they go away, um, they're not in there looking to establish a long-term um sort of retainer uh, arrangement with you which I think sometimes can just be really annoying for us in small business we don't we don't want that we just want um, to pay for a service for a particular length of time and then and then you know be on our way and so that's what I really love about these these platforms is that we um, we just pay for what we need. Do you think that's one of the ways that things are shifting I mean I think 10 years ago with the whole explosion of certain networking groups it was this expectation that if you developed a relationship with someone, there was this backhanded 10% referral fee. I don't hear much about that anymore, apart from a couple of sectors that still do it. Um, do you think that's because exactly that? People just want the service and they just want to be able to walk away? Is that oh, more I of what's so. needed? People, um, yeah, people just, just want to be able to get get the service that they need and then to be able to to move on. And I think a lot of those arrangements are illegal now. Or they need to be disclosed. And mm. once you increase transparency and disclosure, people are uncomfortable with it. Now, what about the big fear that businesses have that they're being undercut by 
people providing really inexpensive but crappy services. I mean, I'll just give the example of bookkeeping. Um, you know, good, reputable, certified bookkeepers will, will charge a certain amount and, and there is a, an industry standard for that, I guess. And then you get, you know, some people who are completely unqualified. They've done a couple of days work in an office management position and they're charging literally half that. That is, I guess, the fear of small businesses. Is some, in your experience, is there something you can say to allay those fears that it's it's not not about that it's sort of it's rounding out a little bit um yeah look there's definitely a fear about this what we call the the race to the bottom um but the the sharing economy is booming more for other reasons like around um um you know choice and convenience uh mary meeker who is an internet researcher um put out a report uh like um a couple of months ago called the Internet Trends Report and she found that um, the average worker in the sharing economy in, in the United States was earning $34 an hour. That's way above what yeah, they're Yeah, and, and the average US worker earns $22 yeah. an hour. Um, and so the sharing economy or the gig economy is a really large marketplace. It includes people at the top end on, say, the platform Expert 360, earning up to $3,000 a day for their expert skills, right down to, um, say, somebody on Mad Paws who's charging $25. What for was that? Mad Paws? Mad Paws, which is a, a pet um, minding platform. So you can have somebody mind your pet overnight for $25. So you've got this really big um, range of services and definitely, yes, there is at the lower end, you get this um, kind of uh, these really low cost services and you get a low quality um Service as a sort of what you were talking about, Alexi. But then you've got at the high end, you've got really high quality services at a high price, and they are, they are delivering a lot of value. And so, yeah, you've just got you can't generalise because mm. of just the the range and the choice that is out there, and the way that the sharing economy is so solving so many problems for businesses. Yeah, and and. Uh Look, let's just look about some of those websites that you are an expert in. We're talking about what the opportunities are for small business to tap into. At the beginning of the program, we touched on the fact that there's space, office space, desk space. Uh, what are some of the space logistics places that people can go to for um, to find out more information? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to, to reiterate, these are these are places that are available on your website that people can yeah. tap through to. Yeah, absolutely. It's a one-stop shop, yeah. So, look, if you've got spare office space, there's a platform called Liquid Space. There's another one called Share Desk. And then there's another one called um, Rubber Desk. Um, and then if you've got spare industrial or retail space, there's one called Alt Space. And if you've got spare kitchen space, there's another one called Cook It Too. So now this is a big thing, isn't it? Yeah. I was I was hearing about this. This sort of taps into the whole menu log delivery. There's cafes out there who normally shut. We all want to go to, go to the city and heaven forbid we want to have a meeting at four o'clock and there's no cafes open. But those cafes are starting to open their space on a commercial basis for people to come and cook in the evenings. And yeah. there's this whole, it's like an underground restaurant restauranting thing happening. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So what's really exciting is that a restaurant may just use its kitchen late in the day and at night and so there's so during the day it's it's free so another business may want to use that commercial kitchen um either for um producing goods that they're going to sell they need a commercial kitchen Mm. um or you know even to um open that kitchen and even open that cafe and then sell um you know, cafe produce out of that premises. So it's that's it's really exciting. And again, it's it's sharing that excess capacity. Mm, exactly. Um, and it, it means that another business can um, test out their um, hospitality idea in a low risk way. They don't need to get a lease. Well, I was going to ask about that actually. Obviously, the lease remains with the other yeah. business, but. Uh, is that definitely a legal arrangement because you are talking about cooking and things like that? You should have someone cast their eyes over. In so terms what of it is, it's Cook It Too is a platform provider, and then they um, facilitate the arrangement between the owner of the kitchen or the the you know the the person that has the lease for the kitchen, and then the um, organisation that is kind of coming in on, on the sublet. Even the way down to the legals. 
Yeah, so wow. they, they organise all of that on their platform. And so the person that's um, setting up, the, you know, who actually owns the kitchen or is, has the lease, they has, have the peace of mind of knowing that, that that the platform is taking care of all of that for them. Yeah, and then, of course, you've got the big guys. You've got Freelancer. Um, and you've got, uh, and you've got, I guess Fiverr, and you've got. I mean, I'm not a fan of those. No, kind I'm of... not so much a fan of the the global platforms yeah. because you've got um, people competing against people in other parts of the world, and, and people who are willing to work for ten or twelve cents an hour. It's just appalling. It, it does break your heart to think that the people are being taken advantage of. But what you're talking about is more tried and tr- tested Australian platforms that that work mostly in the Australian economy? Yeah, or? look, my preference is um, Australian um, Australian labour, basically, mm. because you do have that, you are dealing with people who understand Australian uh, conditions, Australian expectations, and so that that's kind of the, the area that I operate in. Okay, that's wonderful. Look, we're going to take a quick break here again. It's, uh, we've reached the point for community service announcements. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the gig economy, the way that you can tap into it as a small business and perhaps make some money out of it. You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. My name's Alexi Boyd. We'll be back after this. And welcome back to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. My name is Alexi Boyd. We're here talking to Melinda Livingston, talking about all things gig economy and small business and how these two can collaborate to make sure everything is beneficial to all. Now, as businesses, we have pinch points, we have issues, and it's surprising when we were chatting, Melinda, over our lovely coffee in our lovely coffee shop here in Hornsby. It was, it was interesting to find that so many of these pinch points can be solved with with the gig economy. Have you got some examples for us? Oh, look, absolutely, Alexi. I mean, as a small business, we are time poor and we are looking um, for solutions that, you know, are cost effective and a a great value. And the sharing economy just solves so many of these problems for us. And just thinking about my own business and, and the way that the sharing economy has solved problems for me, and um, like one example I had was I needed to find a meeting room to film a client testimonial um, from for a client during her lunch hour right near where she worked. And look, you just think, where on earth would I find a meeting room at a good price for that? So on, on ShareDesk, I found this amazing meeting room for $50 for an hour. That's and fantastic. Right near her work at Surrey Hills. So... I booked it. It was beautiful. I even moved the the day um, to fit around her and with, mm-hmm. at no at no cost at all. And we filmed it. And so, again, that's just the way that the sharing economy can just solve a problem like that. So, if I wanted to um, book a meeting room for a pitch in another city, um, easily done because there are rooms all over Australia where you can just book a room so so easily. Um, yeah, through the sharing economy. You also mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, obviously Expert 360, yeah. is something that if you've got, oh God, I really need a this and I've asked my network of people and nobody can recommend someone. Yeah, absolutely. Is it a bit faceless? Is it a bit of a risk where you go, oh, I don't really know who I'm going to get? Do these places, things have testimonials well, yeah, on them? Look, they've got um, trust ratings. So you can you can see how many times that that consultant has been used before mm-hmm. and the ratings and the... And the um, the testimonials from the people that have used that consultant before. Um, you can look them up on LinkedIn, obviously, as well. Yeah. So you can get a sense of where they, they've worked and their background and experience. And also you would be able to talk to the people that have used that consultant before as well. So, you know, the benefit is that if you are new to business and you haven't got a big network to ask, um, maybe you're new to Australia and you haven't got a big network to ask mm. or you want to do work in a city where you haven't worked before and you want suppliers, um, it's, and you, it's pretty easy to get going and get a whole range of suppliers to complete your project from the sharing economy. And I like what you were saying as well in terms of uh, that whole LinkedIn thing. I mean, it, it sounds as though you can't, it's like we don't not just have a website anymore. You don't just have a website. You've got a LinkedIn profile. You've got a website. You make sure that you do a little bit of advertising on other platforms as well, which is appropriate for your business. Uh, You've got some sort of a presence uh, either in forums or in blogs or you're writing articles. You've got to have a multi-pronged approach. And do you think for those consultants and professionals out there that getting onto one of these gig sites 
is part of that multi-pronged approach? Do you think that's an important thing we should all be considering if we're out there as a service professional? I think if you've got spare capacity, uh, I think it can be really quite quite helpful. And when you see the consultants on Experts 360, many of them do have startups. So they do see Experts 360 as a way for them mm. to earn money as a side gig. Yeah, and, and just to get up and running, I suppose, and start yeah, getting absolutely. some experience. Yeah. The um, the other website that I'm familiar with just through my networking has been WePloy. And I think what they do is they actually provide only admin receptionist staff literally at the last minute. I think you can call in about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning when your staff member's sick and then someone comes in and they take care of everything. And this is what I think we shouldn't be nervous about because the fact that this company, you, you pay them and they cover the super, they cover insurance, they cover workers' comp, they cover everything for that person who just steps in and does it. But there's no expectation, there's no $10,000 finder's fee that you get from Absolutely. a recruitment agency. Absolutely, and they vetted the person as well. Yeah. Um, and I placed somebody on WePloy and they subsequently got a job with the firm that they were placed with on a temporary basis. That's awesome. And so, um, again, you might you might use WePloy to fill... Um, a receptionist position, your receptionist is sick one day and you might like the person so much that you think, hey, I'm going to keep them in my business. So if we're a small business and we're starting to engage with this gig economy, we should, I think from what you're explaining and your expertise, is we should have an expectation that these people are experienced, vetted, um, I guess in a way that part of the paperwork and the compliance is taken care of by these companies. Is this why you push the Australian-based companies more? Oh, they look, better absolutely. Understanding? I think because they understand our market conditions, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Um, and you may be setting up the arrangement on these online platforms, but you're dealing with these people face-to-face ultimately. You're, you know, you were mentioning WePloy. You're actually getting somebody coming into your into your workplace and mm. you're having a face-to-face relationship and that's often the case with Expert 360 as well. So yeah, definitely you're wanting to deal with people that understand the uh, Australian marketplace mm. and if they're coming into your business, they're, um, they're obviously in Australia. Um, but you also need to check the terms and conditions of each of these platforms as well. Um, is insurance provided? Um, what, what actually... Are you, are you getting on on the platform so that you know exactly that your expectations are being met? And also I think there's um, you need to be careful when the job does change that the platform is kept informed um, because I imagine that if you got someone to come in and do some labouring or something, you're having a, I don't know, a cabin built in the backyard and somebody comes in and does some labouring for you and then they say, oh, this is actually going to take two days but we won't go through the platform you can pay the second day in cash. Uh, there's obviously a reason for that, but I, I would be nervous about that because then the second day might not be covered in the same way that the first day was because that was the original relationship. So I think there's a reason why those platforms exist and they're because they're being su- they're quite successful. Yeah, look, I I would suggest not doing anything in the black economy. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the thing. It's, this is the big thing. And that's another thing people might be nervous about is it's not, The black economy. The gig economy is not the black economy. No, the gig economy, if you're using one of these platforms, it's not the black economy. Mm. Uh, They collect a lot of data. They send it to the ATO. They sure do. um, And the ATO has a lot of information on how to um, do your tax in the gig economy, in the sharing economy. And so, yeah, this is not the black economy. Speaking of which, if you are unsure about what your relationship is with these guys in in a tax perspective, absolutely Check it out. ATO has some really good uh, um, Absolutely. links. Absolutely. A lot that. of videos, a lot of information pages. That makes it easy for We people. might actually pop a couple of those links up on the Small Biz Matters yeah, Facebook page idea. as well. Exactly. Look, um, it, it's been a really great journey today. Thank you very much for sharing all of your knowledge about the gig economy and the way that small businesses can tap into. Can you give us a little bit more information about your website and what it does and how people can find out more? Yeah. So my website is incomeconnection.com. I list out all of the um, platforms that I I've talked about today. I've also got an ebook which I've put together mm. on business opportunities in the sharing economy, and that pulls together all of the ways for businesses to save money and to make money in the sharing economy. So it'd be really good um, for business.
businesses to have a look at that. We should put a link on our Facebook yeah, page for that as well. That'd, that'd be, be a great. fantastic resource yeah. because, you know, like we were saying earlier, it's not just about what you can use but also what you can get out of it as well. Absolutely. It's a huge space and it's, it's just growing, so... Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise today on Small Biz Matters, Melinda. Thank and you, And if you want to find out more, make sure you go to incomeconnection.com.au and find out all the fantastic platforms. It's, it's even just fascinating just to look at. I had no idea that there was a desk space platform. I mean, well, that's fantastic. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so thanks for coming on the program. Uh, next week, of course, we've got another fabulous guest coming on Small Biz Matters and we've got a bit of a guest fest going on. If you would like to share some of your expertise and get the word out there about what it is that you do, then do get in touch via either the Facebook page, Small Biz Matters Australia, uh, or you can, of course, check us out on LinkedIn and send us a message there. We love having guests come on the program and tell us all about what they can share with small business. Next week, week. Uh, we do indeed. Oh, it's funny. We should be talking about that. We've got we've got the CEO of WePloy coming on the program next week. So more gig economy info coming out of your ears. And of course, that's all, all about small business advocacy and business education. I've also got a great interview that we've uh, recorded with the CEO of Small Business Council of Australia, which I will share with you next week as well. So thanks again for coming on the program, Melinda. Thank you, Alexi. And we'll see you all next week here on Small Biz Matters, the half hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. My name's Alexi Boyd. See you next week. Week.